Regardless of the work needed to be done, there are people willing and quite able to do it. When I fly into another city, I know there'll be people there doing every job needed to be done. There'll be the girls behind the coffee counters, the sweepers, the porters, desk clerks, cab drivers, housekeepers, maids. I turn on the radio, there's an announcer. It's the same on television. There are the hospital staffs hard at work with a thousand different jobs being handled by a thousand different specialists, from the neurosurgeon to the person who burns the debris. Grocery and drug stores will be open and staffed. If I should need a shirt or a tie, I have only to walk a short distance. And there's a very personable human being, seemingly content to be working in that particular store, in that particular town, on that particular day. It's wonderful in a way, and yet amazing. If I call the police, someone will answer. That's when I need a plane reservation for the return trip. It seems that all these people are sufficiently content in their lives, as we tend to go along in ours. They don't seek difficult answers because I don't believe, and perhaps I'm wrong in this, I don't believe they're asking difficult questions. Does the man from whom I buy my shirt ask himself, what in the world am I doing working here in this shirt shop here in, say, Akron, Ohio? The other day at lunch, I was seated next to a large table at which were seated about 12 men. Listening to their animated and cheerful conversation, I learned they were insurance salesmen, all from the same agency, I assumed. One said something to the effect that there should be some kind of guaranteed income for insurance salesmen. He said it in a joking way, and another piped up and said, yeah, and it ought to be uh, $35,000 a year. Well, at this, there was a great chorus of yells. Right, yeah, hooray, I'll buy that, I'll drink to that. They were as delighted as children at the thought of earning $35,000 a year. And other comments I heard indicated that at least some of them were earning more like nine or 10000 a year. They were nice-looking, well-dressed men, ranging in age from their early 20s to their 40s, and they can be found in every town and city in the country. They're as necessary to our economy as any other important group. But why do they choose that particular way, or settle for what they're getting? Not just the insurance men, but everybody. How about the girl behind the coffee counter at the airport at four in the morning when you're waiting for your plane? What's she doing there? Of what forces does she stand at the confluence at that particular coffee counter in that particular town? Why isn't she studying for a degree in engineering or medicine or agriculture? What is she doing there, satisfied for the moment at least with that job, with the pay she's getting for that job and the hours she has to work, wearing that uniform behind that counter? What were her parents and home like? What did they talk about? What were their aspirations, their educational achievements? I hope you find this subject as fascinating as I do. Dr. William James called habit the flywheel of society. Above all, what caused them to settle for what they're getting? For what they're settling for. What caused you and me to settle what we're settling for? If it's all we really want, that's fine, I suppose, but who has all he really wants? And if there's a gap between what we have and what we want, what are we doing? And what would we like to do? What action are we taking to narrow and close that gap? Perhaps it's more than we truly want. If we have a picture in our minds of what we really want, at least the next step on the ladder, it's good to keep in mind that we also have the key to getting it, and the key is still the same, it's never changed. It's imagination. Remember, imagination is everything. Any one of those young insurance men can earn 35000 a year, the sum at which they were whistling and waving their arms. I spoke at a meeting of CLU's, Chartered Life Underwriters in Hartford, Connecticut, recently, in which practically every man in the room, more than 400 was earning 35000 or more, often much more a year. They had found ways of utilizing their personal resources in such ways as to be of more service to their clientele. The girl behind the coffee counter in the airport, what does she want? What is she looking for? Chances are her culture has taught her, despite everything to which she may have been exposed during her lifetime, that she is to find a husband and settle down to raise a family. What husband? Who? Why? It seems to become a matter of Self-image, doesn't it? We see ourselves in certain lights, living certain ways, doing certain things, settling for different rungs on the ladder, different rungs of education, ways of living, income. But have we done it consciously? That is, have we articulated and decided upon the place we're shooting for? Or have we let it be dictated by our early environment? It can be a conscious choice for the insurance man, the waitress, for you and me. Here are some interesting definitions from a book now out of print by Dr. Emmett Fox entitled Make Your Life Worthwhile. A scientist is one who asks how. A philosopher is one who asks why. A hero is one who does the kind of thing that others are content to admire. A gentleman is one who never takes an advantage. A coward is one who sees the higher and chooses the lower. 
A thief is one who tries to get something on any plane which he has not earned. An adult is a person who has learned to control his emotions. A youthful person is one who's never bored. An elderly person is one who has lost the capacity for wonder. A quack is a doctor of any school who treats symptoms instead of causes. A crank is a person who does not see things in the way we do. Criticism is only an indirect form of self-boasting. The punishment of the liar is that he cannot believe anyone else. The curse of ignorance is that the victim never suspects it. That goes along with Plato's comments on the subject. The malice of poverty is to have nothing to give. The perfect man will be here when the perfect woman is here to claim him. And the man who overstresses his ancestors is like a potato plant. The best part of him is underground. He also had a good bit of advice to give. The present moment is never intolerable. It's always what's coming in five minutes or five days that makes people despair. We seldom worry about the present moment. It's things that we're looking forward to that we worry about. The present job never tires people. It's work that's waiting for them that wears them out. If people would reflect that one can only do one thing at a time, and therefore there's never more than one thing to do at a time, there'd be less fatigue in the world. On Monday, one can only do Monday's work, and for Tuesday's work, there's Tuesday. Healthy fatigue comes from healthy physical and mental work, and usually one night's sleep is enough to repair it. Nervous strain is a different thing altogether, and comes from trying to do tomorrow's work today, or the task at four o'clock at two o'clock. Live in the present, and this applies to both time and place. Keep your attention to the present moment and in the place where your body is now. Do not have your body in New York and your mind in California, or vice versa. Don't have your body functioning at noon and your mind at 6 p.m. Do a good, fair day's work and then stop. Overwork is not productive in the long run. Well, that's good advice, Dr. Fox. I find that a really good night's sleep is my best guarantee of waking up next morning full of enthusiasm and ready to go to work. But there's one more thing we can do that will make an enormous difference in cumulative achievement. In addition to doing Monday's work on Monday, we should spend some time, perhaps a half hour before work, thinking of new and better ways of doing what we do, ways of increasing our service. Jot them down on a slip of paper and drop the paper into your idea file. Some good ideas may not apply today, but will be perfect six months or a year from now. Others will work now. You know, that reminded me of Dr. Emmett Fox's rules for successful living that I'd filed away, which I'll give you in a moment. When I was a youngster, back during the Depression of the 30s, I remember that people hoped for some lucky break or miracle to lift them out of their poor circumstances and magically transport them to a life of affluence and ease. They used to say, someday our ship will come in. And that was a metaphor I was just too young to understand. I had a mental picture of a great ship sailing up to our house in some magical way and offloading great stores of treasure on our sagging stoop, but it didn't show up. We were breaking an important rule at the time and didn't understand it. We were looking for an effect without a cause. The capriciousness of destiny was a favorite subject with the old-fashioned novelist, too. Emmett Fox has pointed out that in their three-volume world, people's lives were spoiled because one letter was stolen and went astray. The hero rose from obscurity to wealth and fame through saving someone from drowning at the seashore. One false step ruined an otherwise promising career. One turn of fortune's wheel solved all problems for someone else. Well, all that is nonsense. We are not at the mercy of some mysterious fate, other than a sudden, unpreventable, and unforeseen physical accident. Each incident in our lives is a trifle, and trifles have only trifling effects. In the long run, you demonstrate your character, and you cannot ultimately miss the mark for which you're fitted because of any coincidence. A particular incident may give you a temporary advantage or cause you passing grief or inconvenience, but it does not change your whole life story. An energetic and enterprising person who attends to his business will make a success of his life, whether he meets a helpful stranger on a plane or not, whether a particular letter concerning him is lost or not. The miscarriage of the letter may deprive him of a particular position. Meeting with a helpful and influential stranger may bring his success a little sooner. But if he has the qualities demanded for success, he will succeed in any case. And I hear Dr. Fox's rules for living successfully. 1. Plan tomorrow's work today. 2. Review the events of the day very briefly before going to bed. 3. Keep your voice down. No screamers wanted. 4. Train yourself to write legibly. 5. Keep your good humor, even if you lose your shirt. 6. Defend those who are absent. 7. Hear the other side before you judge. 8. 
Don't cry over spilled milk. 9. Learn to do one thing as well as anyone on earth can do it. Good rules, aren't they? They may seem obvious, even trite, but each one has hidden behind an enormous power for good and accomplishment. We should never waste our time looking for lucky breaks. Luck is what happens when preparedness meets opportunity. The cumulative effect of well-directed daily effort, even five days a week, is enormous. It builds up a great following wave that sooner or later is going to break all over us. But it isn't just work. It's work spiced with imagination that can do more for us in five years than we might otherwise achieve in forty-five. If a person works like a machine, he can work steadily for forty years with a perfect attendance record and still not achieve much more than ordinary results. We judge the people in our company by being on the job when we want them certainly, but it's the people with the ideas that make things happen who get the big stars after their names. I mentioned that luck is what happens when preparedness meets opportunity. Now, opportunity is always present. It's our preparedness that helps us see it and seize it. And it comes back to Einstein's reason for living. We're here to serve. Preparedness helps us serve better. Using our imagination helps us serve even better. The rewards will come of their own accord. We don't even have to concern ourselves about them. Some time back I met a man who told me a very interesting story. He had been an artillery officer in the Second World War, and his battalion came very close to being overrun during the Battle of the Bulge. They managed to hold their position, but in doing so, they were exposed to the cold for such a long period of time that this officer's feet were frozen. The battalion doctor, who had been an OB man in civilian life, told him that he should send him back to the rear for hospitalization. But if he did, he was afraid because of the sudden great jam of injured flooding to the rear that they might amputate the feet. And he suggested that the officer stay where he was, and while he couldn't promise anything, the doctor would try his best to save his feet for him. Well, as it turned out, he was able to do just that. And today, the Battle of the Bulge and the Frozen Feet are only a memory. But a big part of that memory is of the doctor who went to a lot of special trouble, despite his crowded, hectic days, to save those feet. We can all look back to someone who took special pains to serve us. In many cases, it was a conscientious parent or teacher who refused to be satisfied with just doing his job and no more. I think the lesson there is important. It's that what we do and how we do it is important. We can never tell when something we say or do or a little extra effort we take will go a long way toward helping someone, maximizing our service. Nor do we have to wait for large and important occasions. The opportunity is present every day. Just as we've been helped by thoughtful and conscientious people ourselves, we should remember that a word, an act of kindness or generosity, or maybe just being patient and concerned can make a big difference in someone's life. Every day of our lives is filled with opportunities to be larger instead of smaller, polite and thoughtful instead of rude or careless, to love a little more and hate a little less. And by these small acts, our image will be formed in the eyes of others and in our own. Whether we know the people or not isn't important. By our actions, we're teaching, setting examples, demonstrating to the world that we're mature enough to take the initiative and control our own acts instead of just going along because that's the way, quote, everyone else, end of quote, seems to be doing things. As Wordsworth put it, the best portion of a good man's life is in his little, nameless, unremembered acts of kindness and of love. When we think of service, we tend to think of being busy, but that's only part of the story. Idleness is important, too. The kind of leisure we need in order to listen to that inner voice, to let our imaginations really take off. In his book, The Conquest of Happiness, the famed British mathematician Bertrand Russell blames modern parents for failing to recognize the advantages to their youngsters of what he calls fruitful monotony. He wrote, A generation that cannot endure boredom will be a generation of little men, of men unduly divorced from the slow processes of nature, of men in whom every vital impulse slowly withers as though they were cut flowers in a vase. Today's great concern is for organized, supervised, and directed activity. Each year, fewer children are being left alone long enough to discover and enjoy the world, the time of fruitful monotony. Too many of us feel we have to pacify and occupy our kids with toys and more toys, games and television. Television has to take up some time that would otherwise be spent in creative activity. Robert W. Wells, a feature writer for the Milwaukee Journal, wrote an article many years ago, which I clipped and saved, and he said, Children have an inalienable birthright. 
the leisurely, pressure-free hours when a child is thrown on his own resources and forced to become acquainted with himself. Wells told of a time when he was a boy that he found himself terrifically bored. He complained to his grandmother about having nothing to do. And then he wrote, She took me by the hand and led me out onto the big front porch, where a succession of fiercely preoccupied bumblebees plunged headlong into the blue morning glory blossoms. The sounds and smells of summer were in the air, and his grandmother said, Nothing to do? The world is there. Go use it. And I remember reading about a mother who, when one of her children would complain about having nothing to do, would empty her large container of buttons on the floor and say, There's something for you to do. Pick up all those pretty buttons and put them back in the basket. That only happened about twice with each child before he or she found things to do without coming to complain to the mother about boredom. Boredom is a time, a great time for reflection, for using the imagination. I suppose Isaac Newton was bored when he saw the apple drop from the tree and began to wonder about gravity. You can get your best ideas when you have nothing to do but think. Fruitful monotony. Don't fight it. Use it creatively. Some years back, there appeared in McCall's magazine an excellent article by Sam Blum titled The Perfect Husband. It seems Sam Blum put together some kind of a survey which turned up the interesting fact that women are not particularly interested in handsome men. Extremely handsome men were described as vain and difficult to live with. One woman said, I'd rather have people say, I wonder what she sees in him, than I wonder what he sees in her. Several women insisted that attractiveness in a man has less to do with his looks than with an indefinable bearing and attitude, too complex for men to understand, but instantly recognizable to all women. It's a certain cool that suggests there's a lot more there than meets the eye. These men never bore you, the women said, even when their hair begins to go. That's the attitude we discussed earlier. And as to money, there was not one unmarried woman who felt that a good husband had to be rich. In fact, a number of them specified that he should not be wealthy, at least not in the beginning. One woman said it would take all the fun out of it if I couldn't help him along in his career, if I didn't feel that we were building something together. A few young women even raised the thought that inherited wealth made men unattractive. One girl who had been on the verge of either marrying her boyfriend or breaking up with him for three years sees the fact that life has been just too easy for him as one of the factors that's kept her from marrying him. She said he's brilliant and he's handsome and he's wealthy, yet there's something about maturity that comes through adversity. If you don't suffer a little, you never stop being a kid. Although a great many single women expressed the desire to work after marriage, almost all agreed that their husbands should be able to support them if they should change their minds. Therefore, though they'd cheerfully marry a poor man, he should be a poor man with potential. Despite the fact that almost all women rank a husband's ability to make a great deal of money as relatively unimportant, many insisted that he should have an intense, even aggressive appetite for his life work. Men who were frustrated or depressed by their jobs were written off as hopeless. The willingness to work 18 hours a day, at least when he's getting started, was highly praised, and many an unmarried girl was proud of the fact that she would never come between her husband and his work. You know, there are two important points in that interesting little survey. Women, too, realize the importance of a person's life's work, and the one thing at which he's decided to become great. She should have one, too, of course. And, too, the willingness to work 18 hours a day, at least when he's getting started, was highly praised. Women understand that a man must have an important work to do in addition to wife, home, and family. The home and family can constitute the whole world of many women. It almost never can for a man. Man is the hunter, and he must leave the family to make his mark in the world. Many women must also do this. They simply have no real interest in taking care of a home, nor should they necessarily. The racial memory of tending the fire and babies is bred into every woman, just as hunting is bred into every man. But in some it's stronger than others. And in the modern world, there are a good percentage of women to whom a career outside of the home is much more important to them. Getting back to the Sam Blum survey, one woman said, All diamonds have flaws, and my diamond, my jewel, my husband has more flaws than you'd believe. I often contemplate murdering him for the insurance money. But the thing that keeps me from doing that is that I then look at other women's husbands, and you know, I couldn't stand them for a minute. And so I guess you could define the good husband as the one who, for absolutely no good reason in the world, makes you feel that when you're with him, you're home. In asking the question, why am I here, we should most certainly read the excellent book on becoming a person by the distinguished psychotherapist and psychologist Carl R. Rogers. In Chapter 8, To Be That Self Which One Truly Is, A Therapist's View of Personal Goals, 
Dr. Rogers tells of an important study in which Charles Morris investigated objectively the pathways of life which were preferred by students in six different countries, India, China, Japan, the United States, Canada, and Norway. As one might expect, he found decided differences in goals between these national groups. He also endeavored through a factor analysis of his data to determine the underlying dimensions of value which seemed to operate in the thousands of specific individual preferences. Without going into the details of his analysis, we might look at the five dimensions which emerged, and which, combined in various positive and negative ways, appeared to be responsible for the individual choices. The first such value dimension involves a preference for a responsible, moral, self-restrained participation in life, appreciating and conserving what man has attained. The second places stress upon delight in vigorous action for the overcoming of obstacles. It involves a confident initiation of change, either in resolving personal and social problems or in overcoming obstacles in the natural world. The third dimension stresses the value of a self-sufficient inner life with a rich and heightened self-awareness. Control over persons and things is rejected in favor of a deep and sympathetic insight into self and others. The fourth underlying dimension values a receptivity to persons and to nature. Inspiration is seen as coming from a source outside the self, and the person lives and develops in devoted responsiveness to this source. The fifth and final dimension stresses sensuous enjoyment, self-enjoyment, the simple pleasures of life and abandonment to the moment, a relaxed openness to life of value. Well, that's a significant study. One of the first to measure objectively the answers given in different cultures to the question, what is the purpose of my life? It's also helped to define some of the basic dimensions in terms of which the choice is made. As Morris says, speaking of these dimensions, it's as if persons in various cultures have in common five major tones in the musical scales on which they compose different melodies. But then Carl Rogers writes, I find myself, however, vaguely dissatisfied with this study. None of the ways to live which Morris puts before the students as possible choices, and none of the factor dimensions— seem to contain satisfactorily the goal of life which emerges in my experience with my clients. As I watch person after person struggle in his therapy hours to find a way of life for himself, there seems to be a general pattern emerging, which is not quite captured by any of Morris's descriptions. The best way I can state this aim of life, as I see it coming to light in my relationship with my clients, is to use the words of Soren Kierkegaard, to be that self which one truly is. He then writes, I am quite aware that this may sound so simple as to be absurd. To be what one is seems like a statement of obvious fact rather than a goal. What does it mean? What does it imply? He goes on to point out that he observed a tendency on the part of the person in therapy to move away from, hesitantly and fearfully, from a self that he is not. As one professional man put it, I finally felt that I simply had to begin doing what I wanted to do, not what I thought I should do. This is a complete reversal of my whole life. I've always felt I had to do things because they were expected of me, or more important, to make people like me. The hell with it. I think from now on I'm going to just be me, rich or poor, good or bad, rational or irrational, logical or illogical, famous or infamous. So thanks for your part in helping me to rediscover Shakespeare's To Thine Own Self Be True. A little later, Dr. Rogers quotes Kierkegaard's description of the individual who really exists. An existing individual is constantly in process of becoming, and translates all his thinking into terms of process. It is with him as it is with a writer in his style, for he only has a style who never has anything finished, but moves the waters of the language every time he begins, so that the most common expression comes into being for him with the freshness of a new birth. It's important that you read this small but important book to get the full meaning of how people who find difficulty in finding themselves manage to fight their way through. Dr. Rogers writes, It seems to mean that the individual moves toward being, knowingly and acceptingly, the process which he inwardly and actually is. He moves away from being what he is not, from being a facade. He's not trying to be more than he is, with the attendant feelings of insecurity or bombastic defensiveness. He's not trying to be less than he is, with the attendant feelings of guilt or self-depreciation. He's increasingly listening to the deepest recesses of his physiological and emotional being, and finds himself increasingly willing to be, with greater accuracy and depth, that self which he most truly is. It seems many people find difficulty in realizing that it's perfectly all right to be what they really are. It reminds me again of Thoreau's great comment, We have only to move in the direction of our dreams to meet with a success unexpected in common hours. 
The way I see it, becoming what we are is a process that should go on as long as we live. It's not something that becomes ended, finished. It involves change and moving away from what we are not toward what we are. It can mean repudiating our old selves and old beliefs. And in becoming what we are, we should keep in mind that it is usually through service, whatever service it may be that fits our own unique genetic set, that we'll find meaning, at least in our culture and age. In his summary of Chapter 8, Dr. Rogers writes, The characteristic movement, I've said, is for the client to permit himself freely to be the changing, fluid process which he is. He moves also toward a friendly openness to what's going on within him, learning to listen sensitively to himself. This means that he is increasingly a harmony of complex sensing and reactions rather than being the clarity and simplicity of rigidity. It means that as he moves toward acceptance of the isness of himself, he accepts others increasingly in the same listening, understanding way. He trusts and values the complex inner processes of himself as they emerge toward expression. He's creatively realistic and realistically creative. He finds that to be this process in himself is to maximize the rate of change and growth in himself. He's continually engaged in discovering that to be all of himself in his fluid sense is not synonymous with being evil or uncontrolled. It is instead to feel a growing pride in being a sensitive, open, realistic, inner-directed member of the human species, adapting with courage and imagination to the complexities of the changing situation. It means taking continual steps toward being in awareness and in expression, that which is congruent with one's total organismic reactions. To use Kierkegaard's more aesthetically satisfying terms, it means to be that self which one truly is. I trust, he goes on to write, I have made it evident that this is not an easy direction in which to move, no one which is ever completed. It's a continuing way of life. It is chapter 9, A Therapist's View of the Good Life, the fully functioning person, which I naturally don't have time to go into, but which you should read as quickly as you can get the book. He writes, I believe it will be clear that a person who's involved in the directional process, which I've termed the good life, is a creative person. With his sensitive openness to his world, his trust of his own ability to form new relationships with his environment, he'd be the type of person from whom creative products and creative living emerge. He would not necessarily be adjusted to his culture, and he would most certainly not be a conformist. But at any time and in any culture, he would live constructively in as much harmony with his culture as a balanced satisfaction of needs demanded. In some cultural situations, he might in some ways be very unhappy, but he would continue to move toward becoming himself and to behave in such a way as to provide the maximum satisfaction of his deepest needs. Such a person would, I believe, be recognized by the student of evolution as the type most likely to adapt and survive under changing environmental conditions. He'd be able creatively to make sound adjustments to new as well as old conditions. He'd be a fit vanguard of human evolution. Dr. Rogers adds, This process of the good life is not, I'm convinced, a life for the faint-hearted. It involves the stretching and growing of becoming more and more of one's potentialities. It involves the courage to be. It means launching oneself fully into the stream of life. Yet the deeply exciting thing about human beings is that when the individual is inwardly free, he chooses as the good life this process of becoming. That when the individual is inwardly free, he chooses as the good life this process of becoming. There's some pretty good evidence available that indicates we're smarter asleep than we are awake. It's a good idea to form the habit of remembering our dreams when we can upon arising. Dr. Eric Fromm has written that we are not only less reasonable and less decent in our dreams, but we are also more intelligent, wiser, and capable of better judgment when we're asleep than when we're awake. Arthur Goldsmith reports a case in which the owner of a thriving business in New York City took on a partner. Shortly after he made this decision, he dreamed that his partner embezzled several thousand dollars from him. A year later, the dream came true. The partner actually had filched a large sum of money from the firm. Dr. Fromm explains it as an example of how the unconscious mind sometimes can judge character more shrewdly than can the conscious waking mind. The night before the 1957 Kentucky Derby, Ralph Lowe, the owner of a horse named Gallant Man, had a dream in which his horse was winning the Derby. But suddenly, in the dream, the jockey misjudged the finish line, slowed down, and the horse lost. Lowe then related the tale to his trainer, and the trainer told Willie Shoemaker about it. Willie was the jockey riding gallant man in the derby. 
In the actual race that afternoon, Willie, with his horse in the lead, suddenly pulled Gallant Man up short before reaching the finish line, with the result that Iron Liege won and Gallant Man was second. Dr. Farm explains that the waking mind often is distracted by a kind of psychological noise or static, fear, vanity, prejudice, over-concentration on one aspect of the situation and the like. These emotions and prejudices sometimes interfere with clear observation and accurate judgment. But during sleep, the static is shut off, and we can form clearer, more honest opinions, thus more accurately predicting the course of future events. As another analyst put it, we know more than we think we know. One time a yachtsman who went to sleep aboard his anchored boat was disturbed by a dream in which a voice warned him that another boat was bearing down on him, threatening a collision. He awoke so upset by the vivid warning that he went on deck for a look around. Everything was quiet, although a thick fog had rolled in during the night, cutting visibility to nearly zero. He went below again and fell asleep to have the same ominous dream. This time he was so disturbed he climbed the mast to get a look above the fog bank, and was just in time to see the mast of another vessel bearing down on him. He shouted a warning, and the skipper of the other craft swung his helm, barely avoiding a collision. Now it's possible that the yachtsman sensed in his sleep the distant throbbing of the other craft's engine, a vibration which might carry for considerable distance on a still foggy night. Even though the sound was too faint to register on his waking conscious mind, it may have been picked up by his sleeping unconscious mind, which flashed him a warning of danger through a dream. Perhaps the best answer to the question, do dreams predict the future, is a cautious, limited kind of yes. Dreams express our wishes and feelings. Wishes and feelings motivate behavior, and behavior shapes the future. In Peter Drucker's excellent book, The Effective Executive, he points out that the effective executive focuses on contribution. He looks up from his work and outward toward goals. He asks, what can I contribute that will significantly affect the performance and the results of the institution I serve? His stress is on responsibility. The focus on contribution, service, is the key to effectiveness. In a man's own work, its content, its level, its standards, and its impacts. In his relations with others, his superiors, his associates, his subordinates. In his use of the tools of the executive, such as meetings or reports. The great majority of executives tend to focus downward. They're occupied with efforts rather than with results. They worry over what the organization and their superiors owe them and should do for them. And they are conscious, above all, of the authority they should have. As a result, they render themselves ineffectual. The head of one of the large management consulting firms always starts an assignment with a new client by spending a few days visiting the senior executives of the organization one by one. After he's chatted with them about the assignment and the client organization, its history and its people, he asks, though rarely, of course, in these words, and what do you do that justifies your being on the payroll? The great majority, he reports, answer, I run the accounting department, or I'm in charge of the sales force. Indeed, not uncommonly, the answer is, I have 850 people working under me. Only a few say, it's my job to give our managers the information they need to make the right decisions, or... I'm responsible for finding out what products the customer will want tomorrow, or I have to think through and prepare the decisions the president will have to face tomorrow. The man who focuses on efforts and who stresses his downward authority is a subordinate, no matter how exalted his title and rank. But the man who focuses on contribution and who takes responsibility for results, no matter how junior, is in the most literal sense of the phrase, top management. He holds himself accountable for the performance of the whole. And what applies to the good executive applies also to the good parent or teacher or physician or any person of great responsibility or any person or student who aspires to responsibility. People who do not ask themselves, what can I contribute, are not only likely to aim too low, they're likely to aim at the wrong things. Above all, they may define their contribution too narrowly, like the person who sees something wrong that he can easily and quickly set right, but who says, that's not my job, or I'm not getting paid to do that. As Peter Drucker says, the effective executive focuses on contribution, service. He looks up from his work and outward toward goals, and because his entire concentration is on contribution, he reaps far more in the form of rewards in every department of his life. Thank you.